How great is our God. How great is our God. How great is our God.
you for inviting us into the throne of God, Lord, to opening doors through the blood of Jesus Christ, to make it a way for us, Father, that we could be with you again, that you reconciled your relationship with all men who would come through the blood of Jesus. And I just pray for those who do not know you today, Father, that are out there, that are not in the fold of God, that they would be drawn to you. Lord, that as we read through your words today, that you would draw us closer to you, that you would make us ever more aware of your presence, Father, and your close coming. And we just thank you, Father, for what you're doing today in your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be reading from uh, several passages today, but the largest one is Matthew chapter 24. So if you will go ahead and find Matthew 24, uh, we're going to look at Scripture today. Um, tell you what, Andy, if you hand me that martyr's mirror on that shelf back there, I'm going to read the martyr's minute. Thank you. Each week I read from the martyr's mirror about one of our brothers who has who has suffered and been martyred for Christ. I don't read the entire section because most of it is lengthy. Um, This is um, Matthias this week. Anybody remember Matthias? He was the one the disciples chose. That's right. He was the twelfth one that chose that took Judas' place that they chose, and he he is listed here. You don't read much about him after that in after the Book of Acts, but you uh, we we know that he stayed with the disciples, and here is the rest of his story um, concerning the end of Mark or martyrdom of Matthias, some write that he would not <clears throat> sacrifice to the false god Jupiter and was therefore put to death by the heathen. Others, however, state that for the blasphemy which the Jews said he had committed against God, Moses, and the law, he was sentenced by their high priest, first to be hung on a cross in stone and afterward beheaded with an axe. In short, when he would not deny Jesus his Savior but steadfastly confessed him, his sentence was this, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thine own mouth has spoken against thee. The, thereupon, having been tied on a cross as some rider conducted upon a rock, as others say, he was stoned and finally, according to the sentence, <clears throat> beheaded. <clears throat> that is Matthias. Um, I want to read from Matthew 24. If you want to go ahead and find these other passages. Matthew 24 is by far the largest. Uh, I've got a short section in Luke 17, and then another larger section in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I apologize for my voice this morning. I got out and worked in the in the, the yard yesterday, and 
um, stirred up a bunch of dust and pollen. And um, This morning I want to talk to you about the second coming of Christ. I want to talk to you about the end times. And my message is probably a little different in that I don't have a structured, organized message, but just scripture for us to go over. Occasionally, we find that we forget to talk about things. Do, do you all understand what I'm talking about? Yes. Occasionally, we, we tend to lose track of things. For instance, in a marriage, you tend to forget about the closeness that you have. As you grow older, you forget about goals that you once had. You tend to develop into something that just exists with day-to-day -day functions, and you don't stop and step back and see where you came from and see where you're going and try to view what's happening. Amen? Amen. So we need to do that in the church, too. And I remember as a young teenager when I was saved in the 70s that we talked an awful lot about the second coming of Jesus. We talked about the end times a lot. Mm -hmm. Since that day, it has become clear to me that we are on the very edge of the return of Jesus Christ, and yet very few people talk about it anymore. We all talk about the goodness of God. Churches talk about you know, how God is uh, there to save you and you know, get you a ticket to heaven, and then they just leave you alone. But we know that that we may be here when the tribulation um, approaches the earth. We don't know when that happens to be as far as the beginning of the tribulation, if the church is raptured, the middle, or the end. And I'm going to read you scripture today where when you get through, you're probably not going to be able to see when that is. If you've always been, oh, well, I, I just believe we're going to be saved right from the beginning of it. <coughs> I hope so. I hope that we are. And I believe that a lot of things point to that, and yet we know that there are going to be the elect, the elect are going to be here, according to what I'm going to read you, during the seven-year tribulation. Okay? That should make you want to be ready for it. If you had a storm coming, and you knew that you had protection of a home, but you knew this storm was coming, you know, James Spann in Birmingham, he's our big weather man here in the south, and James Spann says that there's a storm coming, wouldn't you do something? You wouldn't have to be afraid of it, but you could be prepared, couldn't you? There's no need to be afraid of a storm if you're prepared. So I want you to be prepared for the second coming of Christ. In fact, the book of Revelation, which oddly enough I'm not going to read from today, but the book of Revelation says that those that read this will be blessed. Amen. That it's there for you to be blessed. So. A lot of people just skip over it and don't want to read it because it makes them afraid, but it's there to prepare you for the storm and to let you know. And so in Matthew 24, starting with verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building, buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be one left here. There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, first, first point. Everything you see, everything you enjoy, everything that's around you will be gone. Step back a hundred years ago. Step back a thousand years ago at any point in history. Each man and woman believed that their life and their world would always be there. They believed that whatever was here will always be here. We can walk out on our property. We can find very little signs that anybody was ever here. You can walk into the woods and you feel like, I'm the first person that ever stepped foot here. And then you kick up a tin can, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you go right down here in our creek, and on the other side of the creek, um, I found some, some scrap metal down there. And that's brushy down there. That looks like nobody, that land has never been cleared, and yet people had their trash down there. Just about a um, hundred yards up here is a grave with three people who are buried. Why? There was no church here, right? There's no cabin here. Why was somebody buried there? As far back as the old people can remember, nobody knows why that's there. So my point is this. As Jesus told his disciples, everything you see that you're marveling at will be gone one day. Your home, as well as it's made, 
Even if no storm comes through, it will be gone someday. And we, we need to get that. We are not permanent here. We are vagabonds here. Amen? Amen. We are just passing through here. And as soon as we understand that, we can accept eternity and we can accept the reality that this is a temporary boot camp or training ground, if you will, for Christians. We are here because God wants to prepare us for glory. Okay? That also works in your favor because everything that's painful to you, everything that hurts you, everything that you struggle with will one day be over. Amen. As I get older, I have a lot more aches and pains. This morning as I was playing the guitar, my shoulder was really hurting. You know, my voice this morning is I'm struggling with my voice. All those things that you suffer with in your body will one day be over with. All those things that you struggle with in this world, that you struggle to get food on the table, that you struggle to raise your children, you struggle in relationships, you struggle, you struggle, and all that will be over with. So that's that's the plus side of this. You know, all the wonderful things we see, like the buildings that they talked about, Jesus said, there won't be one stone left on another here. This is all going to be gone. Amen? Amen. Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Everybody seems to know that the world will not last forever. Christian, non-Christian, atheist, everybody seems to know that there is an expiration date on this world. You know? Everybody seems to. And... I heard uh, I heard a man talking one time, and he was talking about why a lot of cultures had, and he was talking about Christianity being one of those cultures. But he's he was talking about why all groups of people seem to to think about an apocalypse, and and he said it helped them to accept the bad things that was going on, that there would someday be a release from that. I will tell him that he's wrong, that the reason that it is is because God has said that it is and that when it is then the new kingdom will be here the new heaven and the new earth will be here that your new body will be here so when they asked this and, and said when will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world in verse 4 Jesus answered and said unto them take heed that no man deceive you for many shall come in my name and saying I am Christ and shall deceive you many and you shall hear of war. Okay, let me not get ahead of myself. Right there is the first thing that we need to think about is deception. The church is going through a time of great deception where those who are not grounded in the Word of God, where those who are not really staying close to God are being deceived. The church is going through a time, and I'm not saying the church is going to be split up because people that are really in the church that are really sincere about it that are really close to him are going to continue on and those that are had a half-hearted attitude about it a kind of well I joined the church so I'm a Christian kind of attitude those people are going to be thinned out like the sheep and the goats okay and Jesus said take heed that no man deceive you don't let anybody deceive you well how can you be how could you be deceived how could you be deceived? You know, if, if I went to work and somebody started talking bad about my wife and said, you know, you don't know this, but Angie said this, did this, believes in this, and you don't even have any idea about it. Angie is not the person you think she is. I would tell them, you don't know what you're talking about. Because I know this person. That, in a nutshell, is how you don't get deceived. You have to know intimately God. Amen? Amen? You need to know your God intimately so that you're not deceived. I talked about the counterfeit expert many times here, and I'll say it again for those who, who are joining with us on the Internet. The, the counterfeit expert was asked one time, who, who was an expert on counterfeit money, and he was asked, you know, how many, how many thousands of counterfeits did you have to study to really understand counterfeit money and he said I never 
studied counterfeits. I just studied the real thing. And that's what we've got to do. Is we've got to study the real thing. We need to quit. We need to throw away all these other interpretations of the Bible. And sometimes commentaries will lead you astray. You've got to be careful with commentaries. You need to go back to the Bible. You need to go back to Jesus' words. If you've got a Bible that's got red, like mine is, that's good. Look, read the red. Read the red. Amen? Amen. Verse 6, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, every time that you hear one of these signs like this, you, you say, there's always been wars. Give me a generation on the earth when there wasn't a war. Okay, if Jesus said that this was coming, this must be different. Right? I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? That this would be a different kind of wars and rumors of wars. Right now, we don't have a threat of wars within our own nation like the Civil War was, where the North and the South separated. We don't have that kind of thing. It's got a warning came up on the, a morning message came up. Uh, we don't have that kind of thing. This is, I believe, this is wars that is going on nation to nation and internation, inside nations, cultures, right, families, clans. This is wars going on within families. Oh, wait a minute. Have you ever heard of families that are having wars going on in them? Mm -hmm. We always assumed that everybody that got the name Christian would all band together and would stick together because of the blood that they share. Not the family blood, but the blood of Jesus. We always assumed that. And now, what, what do we see? Oh, we see we start, we're starting to see families separated that, and every one of them in the family calls themselves Christians, and yet separations because this group wants to be more devout and this group says well you're a, a fanatic you're taking it too far you don't have to do that you're condemning me by your own lifestyle even if you don't say it you're condemning me and families are getting separated aren't they mm -hmm. verse 7 for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. When you look up the original Greek word for nations against nations, it says ethnic groups. Ethnic groups. Well, that's going on, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Ethnic groups are, are having wars against each other because of your, the color of your skin or because of your background. People are, are having wars with each other. So that is here, isn't it? So, and the pestilences and earthquakes and famines, well, you can't go through a magazine without seeing somebody trying to raise money for people that are in famines, right? Mm -hmm. Pestilences, uh, anybody ever heard of AIDS? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever heard of Ebola? And you, when you start thinking about it, you can think of a lot of them, can't you? I mean, a lot of those diseases have been modern-day things. So we have all these things coming, and then he says, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. And what that means is birth pains. Birth pains. Well, you ladies, you know about birth pains. Yeah. The birth pains come from something that happened nine months earlier, don't they? The inception of that child, the beginning of that child's life, that birth pain is a result of that. It is a set time, but you don't know about it. You don't know when. You say, well, I, my due date is here. I don't, I've yet to find a woman that had their child on their due date. It's like clockwork, you know, okay, you know, 8.30 a.m. on this day, I'm going to have a baby. Really? You can't do that unless you have a C-section. When the baby decides to, to arrive, that's when it does, isn't it? Right. So we need to understand that all of this is the beginning of sorrows, which is birth pains. That's what Jesus said. These things have to take place because it's birth pains for the world. Amen? Amen. All these things that you, that you just read about, oh, that's bad. Oh, that's bad. Oh, that's bad. I'm afraid. I don't want to live through that. 
Well, you know what, ladies, you understand that you got to have birth pains. It's just part of it, right? And you ladies have really suffered in delivering your children, so you understand that that's just part of it. You don't you don't give up having children because you're afraid of birth pains, right? Right. You don't just say, oh, I'm, not ever, I'm never going to be a mother because I couldn't handle that birth pain stuff. Now, me, on the other hand, I don't think we could. You know, if God had given it to men to have babies, the world would have ended. That's right. It would have been over with. I wouldn't be here. So these are the birth pains. Verse 9, Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. At one time, Christians had a name that was not hated. Now think about it. At one time, Christianity was goodness, peace, right? Went in, the, went in and um, was benevolent, missionary work going into other countries. And now they hate the very thought of a Christian being there, right? Yes. Yes. They hate the thought of Christians being there. We have brothers that are connected with us on Facebook that are um, in countries where their very life is at stake if they stand up for being a Christian. We have yet to see that here as far as stand up. We're in the Bible Belt here in the South, but that day is very closely approaching, is it not? That's right. It's very closely approaching. You know, you, the Internet being so worldwide, um, you, can get, you can get on and make some comment or make a statement or talk about Jesus, and somebody will attack you. Just try and see. Just throw it out there and see if somebody doesn't attack you. Verse 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Offended. Offended. Well, we, we think we know what that means, to be offended. But it is actually to have a stumbling block put in front of them. Okay? So, it's like, well, I didn't mean to offend them, but they got offended. That's why we take that word. But the word actually in the original means to have a stumbling block. Many shall have a stumbling block put in front of them. Many will have their eyes blinded, in other words, so that they don't see what's going on. That's a very important point here. Do you remember when, uh, when God was separating his people from Egypt and Moses hardened his heart against God? And then it says God hardened his heart. Remember? Right. Okay, that's what this is talking about. Many people who are lukewarm for God will be offended. They will have a stumbling block put in. Yes, they will have uh, an offense there intentionally. God will say, you know what, if you didn't want me, if you're going to reject me partially, then you reject me totally. That is what this is talking about. Many shall be offended and shall betray one another. Well, how do you betray one another unless you are sort of part of the same group? Right? Do you see that happening in the church today? Mm -hmm. Amen. We do, don't we? We see people who are uh, churches splitting like never before. We see families splitting like never before all over the name of, in the name of Christianity. The many shall be, betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 12 says, Sin is going to be rampant. And because of it, the love, the love of Christ for many will wax cold, will grow cold. Well, because of pleasure's sake, right. the love will grow, will, for God will grow cold. There is, there is a, uh, there is a percentage or statistic rather that the percentage of number of people going to church is, is like this. It's just dropping off. Yeah. You know, we, we choose to, to meet. We, our family, we choose to meet. And we sometimes will meet not on Sunday morning. You know, we will say, you know what? Show up on Tuesday night. Let's have worship. Show up on Thursday night. Let's have Bible study. And we, we do it ourselves. Right. We have done it for years and years. But there are many people that have a church to go to. They show up when it's convenient. 
they don't have to do anything when they get there. They can creep in the back door, show up on the show up, sit on the back pew. As soon as Amen says to end, they get up and leave. And it's you know they do that every now and then. It makes themselves feel good. It's it's more of a I feel dedicated to do it well, at least twice a year. You know. So, but why do they what do they do with their with their Sundays and the rest of the year? What do they do with their time? Well, you know, you wake up and you say it's a beautiful day. Why don't we why don't we get on the pontoon boat and hit the river? You know, I, I feel so close to God in the woods. Praise the Lord. Because yes, you can have a lot of fun out there. There's so much that you can do in this world. Amen. Amen. There is so much you can do for pleasure. There's so much you can do that's fun. And you say, Well that's not that's not sin. It's not sin to go fishing. It might be. It might be if you should be worshiping God, it's sin. Amen? Now you just missed a good opportunity to say amen. 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 Verse 13, But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. He that shall endure to the end. I gave a message a few weeks ago about being an overcomer, and that if you was not an overcomer, then you was not saved. And if you did not overcome until the end, then you was not saved. Right. That is the true sign. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and this gospel, the kingdom, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto the, to all nations, and then shall the end come. When you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in, the, in Judea Flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning or of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And I'm going to read one more. I know I've read a bunch without commenting, but it, verse 22 is very important. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. Excuse me, I've got a, I've looked at that light, and I've got a flash, blank place where I'm looking. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh, there should be, should no flesh be saved before the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For the elect's sake, those days shall be short. Now we know that the tribulation is a seven-year period. Everybody, everybody agree with that? Yes. The tribulation is a seven-year period. At the beginning, a lot of people believe that Jesus will rapture his church. Then there will be seven years. There will be three and a half years. Of a, when the Antichrist will make peace for the whole world. He'll make a covenant for the whole world. There will be an unholy trinity. Right? Right. And the the, uh, the world will be at peace for three and a half years. Then at the end of that three and a half years comes the abomination of desolation. Right? right? Which is where he will sacrifice to the devil on the altar in Jerusalem. He will show himself to who he is. Everybody, everybody remember that? Right. And that was in verse 15. And then in verse 22 Jesus said, Except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. Now, we know that that seven-year period is there. So does that mean that the church will be here during that time? Right. Everybody, get, everybody gets that puzzle look when I say that because it's not clear, is it? How could the elect, how could he shorten those days because it's a set time? When he comes back to the Battle of Armageddon, and how could that be shortened for the elect's sake if we're already gone? Now, when I used to teach um, youth group, they wanted to study the book of Revelation. So I got myself a handy book that went verse by verse, and I went through there, and I just pretty much, it was like it was like leftovers in the refrigerator. You know, you just reheated. I just reheated the message, and I just said what this guy said. You know, what is verse, Brother Paul, what does verse 7 mean? Well, it means, and I just read this. And that, when I read through that, 
the man explained it in uh, chapter 3 to chapter 4 of Revelation. He said, and here's where the church is raptured. Now, and you read that verse, his explanation was where uh, the voice from heaven told John the Baptist, or John the Revelator, uh, come up and see what was going to happen. Come up. And when you read that, that was what they said was the church being uh, taken up before the seven years. And even when, back then when I was reteaching that, I kept thinking... That's not really solid. You know, like when you look on ice on a lake and you go, I, I could walk across that, but it doesn't really look solid, so I'm not, I don't think I'm going to put any weight on that. Yeah. So I didn't put any weight on it. And that was 20 years ago. And I've done a lot more reading since then. I've done a lot more thinking and more studying. And I'm not so sure when the church is going to be raptured. Okay? Now, we want to show you something in Luke 17. Luke 17. The rest of this chapter is more about that, and for time's sake, I'm not going to read that, but I encourage you to read the rest of chapter 24. Luke 17, 26. Luke 17, 26. And as it was in the days of Noah... So it shall be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, does this mean mid-trib? It sounds a lot like it, doesn't it? Because when the, when the Son of Man is revealed, it could be when the church is raptured, right? But however you read this, people will be doing everyday life right up to the time. Life won't be like an apocalypse or, or zombies attacking or like some movie portrays now. Life won't be like that, where a great meteor comes and hits the earth and, we're, and the entire world is struggling to find God. Life won't be like that. Life will be going just like normal, right? Now, we understand that there, things will be bad. Things are bad now, right? Everybody agree with that? Right. Things are bad now. The economy's bad. We've got evil men in government. We've got uh, people falling away from God, right and left. But this is saying that in every day-to-day -day life, people will be buying and selling and building and marriage and giving in marriage, uh, just having their normal lives. And right up to that time when judgment comes. So don't think that there's going to be some great, uh, wow, we didn't know that would happen, prophecy for you to pinpoint, now I'm going to get my life straight. It's going to happen. In a day and an hour when you think not, it's going to, when the Word says it's going to happen. Uh -huh. Everybody agree? Amen. Now, all that being said, I want to get to the real scripture this morning that I want to talk about, and that's 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you would find 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is where we'll finish up. And please pray for me because I have got a spot that I'm seeing a big bright light like I had a flash bulb went off. And I'm having trouble reading this morning. You want Amy to read it for you? 2 Timothy 3. Well, I'm going to have to read all my notes. Let's see how I do with this lamp turned off. I think it's bright enough. Yeah. Now, Paul's writing to Timothy, but really this part was not for Timothy. Okay? This part was for us. Amen. Amen? Because Timothy was a young preacher, and he was writing to him a lot about the structure and order of the church, things of that day. 
And in verse 3, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous means dangerous. Dangerous times will come in the last days. Now, I'm going to read through this down to verse 5. Then I'm going to go back and I'm going to break down each word of this because we need to understand these type world that we will be living in in the last days. Verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So we have a general picture of society in the last days. And I want to go through this, and I want you to judge in your heart, is this today? Are we there? Okay, now I went back to the original words, and I got us, for words that are not so self-explanatory, I got the definition of the original Greek word in that. So I start with verse uh, 2, covetous. Uh, we know what coveting is, but this this uh, means loving money. Okay? Loving money. So it has to do with loving money. Wanting money. Wanting to have money. Willing to do anything for money. Amen? Boasters. Um, you know, it's one thing to brag when you when you really have done something well. That's that's in itself is bad enough. But this means an empty pretender. Somebody that really doesn't have a right to brag and they're doing it anyway. Somebody that's boasting. So an, an empty pretender. The next one's proud. Um, put, putting yourself above others. You know, you're... You're better than everybody else. Blasphemous. Speaking evil against the things of God. Speaking evil against the things of God. Disobedient to parents, that's exactly what it meant. Just disobeying your parents. Don't you think that's a little odd that that's in here? Mm -hmm. Of this list, it shows a breakdown in families. It shows that families are not going to be able to be, have such control over their children. 